Good evening. This is Robert, your host, Robert Maynard. Welcome to Operation, the January's edition of Operation Sedi on the Hill. Tonight we're going to do a show entitled from a, Poverty Cure from Aid to Enterprise. The title of the show is taken from a video series that I got from the, the group called the Action Institute for Religion and Liberty. And basically, it's a story about this, what is called the Poverty Cure Network, which is a network of roughly over 400 different organizations in 150 different countries that have been exploring a new approach to dealing with poverty. This is in developing, mostly in developing nations. And they have come to the conclusion that the aid-based model, if it doesn't transfer from, aid can be okay in the beginning when you're, you need a quick emergency assistance. But if it's a long-term, it doesn't substitute for long-term development. And a lot, in, in many situations, a lot of um, people in developing countries have found that it actually can be counterproductive. It encourages dependency. It, a government to government transfers usually end up in the hands of the government recipients and they use it to consolidate their power base and it spurs corruption and so there's a lot of problems with the aid system itself and there that's why the uh, title they're looking for a solution to poverty cure that transfers from aid to enterprise that's why it's called poverty cure from aid to enterprise now there has been Statistically speaking, there has been a very recently, particularly in the, the decade of the 2010s, but in general, 20th, 20th century in general, after the fall of communism and the, the um, release of the East, a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries and the people started looking for a different approach to dealing with poverty and they've started to um, explore enterprise-based enterprise models. But particularly in the 2000 decade of the 2010, according to a lot of statistics, there's been oh, a large percentage of the world's population has been moving themselves out of poverty. There's still a problem, and we've got a long way to go, but the, the um, prognosis is looking good. And I think um, what we need to do is to, t to take a look at what this network is doing and how they're doing it and what works and what doesn't work. And that's what this series is. The, the series is looking at the Poverty Cure Network and it's called Poverty Cure from Age Enterprise. And the, the series was a series of six different videotapes that roughly a half hour each. So it was close to three hours series, but it, I want, there is a um, video I want to show that's just it's roughly seven minutes long. It's an introduction to the Poverty Cure series videotapes. And so I would like to show that video. And then I want to talk a little bit about the, the Poverty Cure series, the series itself, and go into some of the issues that are being raised. So let's take a look at that video. Another increase in poor nation aid. The World Bank said yesterday that it would almost triple lending this year to help prevent a, quote, human crisis in developing countries amid the turmoil in financial markets. Machiavelli said, the reason there will be no change is because the people who stand to lose from change have all the power. And the people who stand to gain from change have none of the power. Machiavelli was describing the global aid system today. We can't continue to talk about the tragedy of poverty and not talk about aid. Over two trillion dollars have been spent on aid. Aid creates dependency. More aid and more aid and more aid. We've seen that aid has subsidized dictators, encouraged inefficiency. Most of the money for aid doesn't actually get to the poor. Aid has delayed the development of, uh, of business in Africa. It has kept Africa behind. It becomes a way of colonizing the economies of the poor countries. 
a system of economic slavery. You create that parental relationship. It's patron-client, it's master-slave, it's all broken. These are the strategies of the last 50 years, and they failed for 50 years, and they're going to continue to fail. It's time to change. If the African nations today agreed together and say, no more aid, I tell you, they can grow slowly, but they can grow. Economic transformation in the long term comes from locally run, locally owned businesses. We need to transform our good intentions into things that actually work. And what works is allowing these individual human beings, creating the image and likeness of God, to create value and prosperity for themselves. We are working to train people into entrepreneurship and be disciples of God in transforming their own nation. I've seen that. I've seen that through my business. Nobody owes us anything. You don't expect the whole world to be able to address your own problems. We are here to meet up front these challenges we face. Entrepreneurship should become something that is the language and the life of our day-to-day -day people. To create capacities in the people, to empower them to be able to stand on their own. People have lots of energy, lots of capacity. Business is the normative way in which people rise out of poverty, not state-to-state -state aid, not the largesse of politicians and bureaucrats. It might not be very romantic to think that it's just humdrum business, but it's true. These people are the engine of growth. They are changing slums into cities. Instead of training job seekers, we train job makers. A sense of independence, a, a sense of human dignity, confidence, knowledge, empowerment, opportunity, character, responsibility, hard work, vision, self-esteem, the new moral purpose, abundance of life, economies can grow. Anything is possible. And it's high time we stop telling our people they can't do it. Yes, we shall do it in the name of God. There's a false notion that poor countries are poor because rich countries are rich. And that somehow there's a, a justice requirement that wealthy countries have to transfer money from developing countries' taxpayers to developing countries. They think they owe the poor people to give them money without thinking about how they are going to use this money. What Africans need are not handouts. What all people need are the foundations to allow them to live out their freedoms and live out their responsibilities, to fail and to succeed. So having a heart for the poor isn't hard. Can we have a mind for the poor? Can you really relate to the poor on a one-to-one -one basis, as equals, as partners, as colleagues? Can we allow them to put the locus of responsibility for their own future on themselves and then be willing to be guided by their vision? And if you give people that foundation, then they're going to create success, they're going to create wealth that no state could ever create. Private sector has the bigger role and it grows and grows and we begin to drive the bottom of the pyramid the other way around, we flip it around because it is possible. It's worked in other societies. Um, it can work for Africa. Whether you are born in the richest family in the world or in the poorest family in the world, you have the same capability as a human being. It's a question of how you unleash that energy that is packed into you. So small and medium-sized enterprises are a critical part in the development process. Job creation, employers who provide income for families who can take uh, whole communities out of poverty. And that's what markets are, they're networks of human relationships where people get together and solve problems closest to them 
It's time to move the locus of power away from the aid industry into individual communities, individual countries, where they can choose their own strategy to create prosperity. The purpose of prosperity is not itself. The purpose of prosperity is to create stronger societies. We need to be able to move from aid to production, from existing to living. It is the way it was meant to be for us to leverage our communities out of poverty. People have the dignity of putting food on their table, shelter, health is provided, education is provided for their children. Good intentions don't end poverty. Enterprise and freedom end poverty. Okay, now I want to... The series is, there's about six. Let me make sure that this doesn't start again there. There's about six um, issues in the series. But I'm going to flip the order and I'm going to go to the religious explanation as to first. Because a lot of the, the vision behind it was a, was a religious vision. He said, well, what does that have to do with poverty and cure and poverty. I mean, this is an economic question. And the two don't. Well, actually, the two do relate if they understood properly. The vision was a religious vision based upon the understanding of the nature and of the human person. And the question that they raise in there is not what causes poverty, but what causes wealth. And they were, they're under, they believe, according to their religious vision, the human being is not just another animal, but where a being is created in the image of God. And so this was the premise behind this exploring this new question, what, let's focus on what causes wealth. And so you, they came to look upon economics as a discipline from that the Acton Institute has been pursuing called for a while I, that I've studied for a while it's called economic personalism the economics the economic implications of deal, seeing the dignity of the human person is more than just another animal this present this view was based upon the philosophy of the late Pope John Paul called personalism the dig, nature and dignity of the human person now he was a Christian, but his personalism is, is universal as he was a professor of philosophy. And so his vision wasn't just a Christian vision, but it was a universal vision of the dignity of the human person. And the vision took the Garden of Eden story as a archetypical story about human nature and applied it to human interactions. And so the most probably, no, no, most like, the most wide-ranging example of this approach was from St. Augustine. And so Augustine's looking at the human person in the context of the story of the Garden of Eden in Genesis, where they're created in the image of God, so therefore they must be created people. So instead of looking at economics in terms of wealth distribution, they're looking at economics in terms of wealth creation. Because the individual is a created in the image of God, so therefore they must be creative beings. So the focus is upon the individual, individual transcendence, individual tr transcendence where we realize our potential, is essentially a religious vision where the individual transcends himself in this relationship with something that transcends nature. I'm running a little bit late, so I got to speed this up. But um, oh, what's the the um, psychologist B. F. Skinner once said that if you apply the human the the, the um, scientific method to human behavior, you have to assume that human beings are not free, and so. Looked at scientifically, human beings are the object of a scientific experiment. We're not free agents that are acting on our own volition. Well, that's not that's a, that's a the modern worldview based upon applying Newtonian science to human behavior, 
and it doesn't allow for human free freedoms and it doesn't allow for creativity and economics is more a focus on distribution of existing wealth than creation of new wealth. If you look at the person as a, as a creative being who is able to use limited resources in unlimited ways because of creativity, then the focus goes to creation. And then the second part where Augustine is talking about the first part of economic activity should be focused upon human creativity. Human beings created in the image of God, repeating the pattern set back by God in Genesis when he said in the beginning there was, and then he created out of nothing. So an act of creativity. So this human beings as the image of God is first and foremost our task, our nature, our tendencies to create, to bring new things into being, to be, to, exp to act in, in, to engage in an act of self-expansion. We're expanding ourselves into, into well, be all that you can be. The second is to reach out to others. In the Genesis account, it says, you, we may, I made all these plants and fruits and of the garden for, 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 in other words, he's providing for Adam and Eve. So the second part, first part is creation. In order, in order to have something to provide to others, you have to create. So you, a lot of people, they want to distribute goods, but not focus on, on the um, creation of goods. So the economic system is about um, sharing with others. Well, you have the, the, the um, sharing of goods you say, well, they're not sharing, they're actually buying and selling. Yes, because in, in human nature, in our society, in order to create a system that's going to be sustainable, you have to have, the people creating need to benefit from what they're creating, otherwise they can't continue creating. So yes, there is the purpose of the profit motive and profit in business is not one of greed, it's one of sustainability of the system. So you ha in cases of poverty, you have charity, you have the sharing of others willfully, but in cases, the general interaction is a, a, um, an exchange of value between two, you, eventually you want to deal with people as equals. So you give something of value, they give something of value, and this <clears throat> generates more value and increases the overall wealth of the pie. So it's not greed, it's creativity and sustainability that sustains the system. And you don't want to have the situation where people are in a situation where they're receiving something for nothing. <clears throat> You have, that is okay for a certain period of time to get people on their feet, but it devalues them as human beings and their, their ability to, to contribute to this overall system of economic sustainability. And eventually it spiritually does damage to them. So you, you, you don't want this client server. Sir, I mean, you, you, you get this, this person is a, a, a master servant. You, you want a partnership between between people and this is what the the system of enterprise is all about is not just about the typical thing so they go into free markets and they go into a lot of stuff that I could go into later on when we have a follow-up show and we'll, we'll do that and <clears throat> this might be something we might want to do I, I haven't figured out what next month's show is going to be yet but we're going to be going into different things but uh, Human potential is a lot greater than what we um, realize. And we see religion as this institutional thing that we go on Sunday, Saturday, Friday, whatever, to a mosque, church, or synagogue, and we engage in religion. But human beings are religious beings, and religion is something that we are, not something that we do. And I think it has to do with the realization of human potential and how we share that and, all, and how we apply that to all aspects of life, including pri and primarily, in this case, economic. Thank you so much. This has been the January edition, and I'll be back. No, I won't be back next month because we're doing, they're doing, I think they're doing some town hall meetings, so we'll probably be back in March. We'll see you then, and have a good night. Take care.